Last semester, you probably talked about the damped harmonic oscillator, but you may not have spent much time on the damped driven harmonic oscillator. So this is the system of a mass, spring, and shock absorber that's also being pushed by some sort of periodic external force. We don't really spend a lot of time on it in mechanics usually because there's so much else we have to get to, but it's a really important part of this electrical oscillator. The reason is the series RLC circuit, if all we could do was charge up a capacitor and put it in the circuit, it would be a damped oscillation and it would disappear, usually pretty quickly on the human time scale, depending on how you choose your component values. So we need to have some kind of external driver if we want it to be interesting. Our external driver is, of course, an electromotive force or a voltage. And we don't want to use a battery because, again, things will get very boring and settle down to nothing quickly. Uh, the battery would charge the capacitor up until it reached full charge of C times the battery's EMF, and then everything would stop. The current would stop. This may, again, take a millisecond. So this is kind of like putting our mechanical oscillator on an inclined plane instead of a flat table. It doesn't really change things in an interesting way. Now what would be more interesting is if we take the RLC circuit and connect it to the output of a generator, which is an AC source where AC stands for alternating current. The battery is DC or direct current. Our symbol for an AC source is going to be a circle with a sine wave, one cycle of a sine wave in it. And we want to know how our circuit elements will behave when we power them like this. So first we specify that the source has an EMF that changes with time as some amplitude V0, this is its maximum value, times sine of omega t. This angular frequency is related to the regular oscillating frequency f, just like it was last semester, where omega equals 2 pi f. In the United States, f is 60 hertz for us. If you go to Europe, it's 50 hertz. Now to see how the RLC circuit will behave when we drive it with an AC signal, we're going to look at each component individually. The resistor is the simplest behavior, so this is the simplest possible AC circuit. We've got a generator connected to a resistor. We already know V equals IR, and if our voltage as a function of time is V naught sine omega t, then the current of, as a function of time will just be that divided by R, V naught over R sine omega t. The current and the voltage are in phase. If we plot them here, of course we couldn't use the same y-axis for both. We'd have to add a second axis over here where one side is volts and one side is amps. But anyway, what we'll see is they peak at the same time, they go through zero at the same time, they go to the negative maximum at the same time. They're always in phase. Now, they are changing constantly, notice, and that's the alternating current part. What we really need to do is get a time average of this. And the way we can do that is take advantage of the fact that power is work divided by time, and we can just look at the work done in one cycle. So that would be integral from 0 to 2 pi over omega, which is one full cycle, of I times V, our power, with respect to time. We put in the values for I and for V, and we get a really a pretty simple integral. It's integral of sine squared. And what we end up with is V naught squared T over 2R. T is our time for one cycle again. So our average power, we divide by that T, and we would say it's V naught squared over 2R. Now the thing that's a little bit annoying here, this is half of the formula that we got for DC power. There we just said it was V squared over R. The problem is V naught is this maximum size of the voltage, and the voltage only has that value for an instant. So we don't really expect it to be the same power delivery as a battery that had that same voltage at all times. So it, it makes sense that we don't get V naught squared over R, but we really kind of want to keep the old formula if possible. What we need is a way to compare AC and DC voltage sources directly. And the way we can do that is we can say, all right, what DC voltage source would generate the same power as an AC voltage source of this form. In other words, let's say you want to uh, take your toaster camping with you and you've got to find a battery that will make it work just as well as it does at the house. If the peak voltage at the house is 170 volts, you're not going to need a 170 volt battery, but we want to figure out what size do you need. So what the math above says is when we average this, what we're going to get is 
the average of sine squared. We multiply the two sine terms. This is what sine squared looks like. And what you can imagine graphically is if we had a little calculus bulldozer and we could knock off the tops of these peaks just enough to fill in the valleys so that everything was level, the height where things would get level is the square root of 2, or is uh, v naught divided by square root of 2. So here's where we'd be. And now actually, uh, the way I've, I have plotted this, it's a little bit off. Here we're showing sine squared, and I'm showing 0 0.707, which is what the voltage would be for just the sine. So that needs to be fixed. But the idea is, what we're defining here is a root mean square voltage. We don't want to take the average of sine, because we know the average of sine will be zero. We have to come up with something more useful than that. So what we're saying is, if we square it, take the average, take the square root of that, that's the RMS voltage. This is the thing that's directly comparable to a battery voltage. And when people say that the voltage of an outlet in your house is 120 volts, that's what they mean, VRMS. So if you wanted to replace your toaster with a, your toaster's plug with a battery, it would have to be a 120 volt battery. Now, the way we keep the look of the old formula is to break this factor of 2 into 1 over square root of 2, two pieces like that. So what that means is we can keep the old formulas, P equals IV equals V squared over R equals I squared R, as long as we say, well, the I and V we're talking about are VRMS or IRMS. We're using that instead of the amplitude, the maximum value. The only thing we have to keep in mind is the connection between RMS and maximum value is 1 over square root of 2. So now we can use the same formulas. We don't have to worry about a dragging a half everywhere we go. Now, it seems like it's a waste of time right now, but we'll need it soon. We use the idea of a phasor diagram to understand this. The phasor here, this is just a, it's basically a vector that rotates counterclockwise at an angular velocity of omega. And as it goes around, you can imagine the projection of it on this axis will reach a maximum and then zero and then a negative maximum, a minimum, and then zero. It'll go around and around like that and the projection will behave like a sinusoidal curve. So what we could say is this is our amplitude for the current and whatever this is at any given instant, that's our value for the current at that instant. The reason we do this is we can put voltage and current on the same plot now even, they're, even though they're completely different units. For a resistor we see that they are in phase. So they both go around this together. They peak, they go to zero, they go to the negative, you know, negative minimum, they come back to zero. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're using this to represent phase relationships, so that's why we call it a phaser. And we'll see the point of this later. Uh, this is kind of like what we did last semester. If you remember, we were trying to, to connect the omega angular velocity to the frequency of a mass on a spring. And there's not any immediate connection at first until you realize if you put a mass on a table and rotated it at omega and looked at the shadow of it on the wall, the shadow would move back and forth just like a mass on a spring with an angular frequency omega. So it's, it's a little bit like that. We're looking at this thing rotating around and we're just looking at the projection of it to give us the current or voltage. So that's what all this is telling us here. And the reason we introduce it is, what happens when we look at a capacitor? Well, okay, now I've got this uh, AC voltage source, a capacitor here. We want to find out what the connection is between current and voltage here. We have the main capacitor equation, Q equals CV. We know what V is, right? It's an AC source. So we could say this is Q as a function of time. Now, how would we get current from that? we have to take dq dt. That's an easy calculus problem. We'd pull out an omega and get omega cv naught cosine omega t. If we want, we could use a trig identity to rewrite that as omega cv sine omega t plus pi over 2. Now, this is going to let us learn a couple of interesting things. First of all, what's the average power dissipated into heat 
from this capacitor. We do just what we did for the resistor, integrate over a cycle, IV, we put in our new value of I, and what we find here is after we take the constants outside, we've got the integral of cosine times sine over a full cycle, and you may already know that will give you zero. So what this is telling us is the capacitor is not consuming any power in a full cycle, and the reason is half the time it's charging up and the other half it's discharging and returning that energy to the circuit. Now, of course, if we had a real capacitor, it would have some resistance associated with it since the, wire, since the leads are made out of regular wire, and there will be some energy loss to heat, but this is our ideal capacitor. What does it look like if we plot the voltage, current, and power? Well, the green here is the, or the red here is the voltage, the green is the current, that's the cosine, and the blue is their product, the power. If you notice, the blue is above the line, or positive, as often as it's below the line. So this is why we get zero net power consumption here. The other thing we notice is the green current line leads the voltage by a quarter cycle, which you could also call 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians or whatever. It may look like I've got that backwards since uh, the red is over here to the right, but remember the direction of time. If you imagine covering this whole thing with an index card and then sliding it to the right, what you'd see is first you get the maximum of the green line, the current, then you get the maximum of the voltage a quarter of a cycle later. Now, this, so what does it look like if we plot the voltage, current, and power? Well, we can see here the red is the voltage, the green is the current, the blue is their product, which is the power. And we can see half the time the power is positive and the other half it's negative. So the average of this blue curve is certainly zero. The other thing we can see if we look at this in comparison to the resistor plot, there we had the product of two sine waves, and we got something like this that was always non-negative. So it might have been zero for an instant, but it was always positive the rest of the time. Now, when we look at this plot here, we have the green leading the voltage. The current leads the voltage by a quarter cycle in this picture. And that quarter cycle, we can also think of it as 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. It may look like that's a typo to say that it leads the uh, voltage because it's here to the left, which we might think of as behind it. But remember, if you imagine covering this whole thing with an index card and then slowly revealing it by moving the card to the right, like you would do to represent the passage of time, you'll find that the green peaks, and then a fraction of a cycle later, the red peaks. The memory aid for this is to remember ICE, ICE, as in the current I is in front of the EMF, or voltage E, in a capacitor. The phasor diagram then looks like this, where we have the voltage phasor here, the current phasor here, since we're rotating counterclockwise, the current phasor is 90 degrees ahead of the voltage phasor, as we said. One other interesting thing to discover is that there's something like Ohm's law for the capacitor and AC circuit. I don't mean the Q equals CV thing that's like Ohm's law, but rather a connection between the magnitude of the current and the magnitude of the voltage. If we want to find it, we can go back to this equation for I, if all we care about is magnitudes, we can get rid of the sine part, and we have essentially I equals omega C V naught. Ohm's law tells us V over I is the resistance, but V over I here is something we call the capacitive reactance. The symbol is XC, and we could write it as 1 over omega C. This has to be measured in ohms, and if it's going to be something like a resistance, it has to be measured in ohms. What does it mean? Well, it's frequency dependent rather than constant. We consider resistance to be independent of frequency, and that's not exactly right because of something called the skin effect that you can look up if you're interested, where high frequency currents flow more along the outside of a conductor than the inside part. Now, if we reduce the area of the wire that the 
current C's, that's equivalent to increasing its resistance. So we could say resistance goes up with frequency, but it's a pretty small effect, and especially at low frequencies like 60 hertz, it's a lot more important at radio frequencies. So for our purposes, we consider R to be a constant. Now, we can't ignore the frequency dependence of this capacitive reactance, so we have to try and understand it. What it's telling us mathematically is, at higher frequencies, the capacitor allows the current to get larger and larger. If we go to the limit of infinite frequency, we'd get zero reactants, and we could get infinitely large currents from small voltages. Of course, this isn't physical, but it shows us the trend. At low frequencies, we see the frequency drops, the capacitor does more and more to stop the current, and then the limit of omega going to zero frequency, or DC, we get no current at all after the initial charge up. Now, what's the physical explanation? At low frequencies, we know the capacitor would charge up and the voltage would be the same everywhere, and there's no reason for current to flow. What happens at high frequencies? Here's one way you could think about it. At high frequencies, the electrons are changing direction very rapidly. We already know the actual electron speed, or the drift velocity, is very low. It's millimeters per second or less. So if your maximum speed is that low and you're changing from forward to reverse thousands or millions of times a second, what fraction of the circuit will an electron ever see? For almost all the electrons in the circuit, all they'll ever see is the wire. There's only a tiny fraction very close to the capacitor that would ever see it and notice a break in the wire. So it's kind of reasonable that re the resistance should be almost zero, just like we'd have in a wire going around the circuit. We could model this by saying that in a DC or low frequency circuit, the capacitor acts like a broken wire with infinite resistance to current flow, while in a high frequency circuit, it acts like a straight wire, no resistance to current flow in our idealized world of perfect